Well, good morning, Foothill Church. My name is Gracie, and I serve on the worship team here at Foothill. <clears throat> Today's scripture is found in Exodus 38. I will be reading a selection of verses from this chapter. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its breadth. It was square and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it and he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all its utensils of bronze. And he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge, extending halfway Way down. He cast four rings on the four corners <clears throat> of the bronze, excuse me, grating as holders for the poles. He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he made the court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. Their twenty pillars and their twenty bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. Bezalel made all that the Lord commanded Moses, and with him was Aholiab, an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. All the gold that was used for the work and all the constructions of the sanctuary, the gold from the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels. The silver from those of the congregation who were recorded was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels. The 100 talents of silver were for casting the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, the bronze that was offered with 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the bases for the entrance of the tent of the meet of meeting, the bronze altar and the bronze grating for it and all the utensils of the altar, the bases around the court and the bases of the gate of the court, all the pigs of the tabernacle and all the pigs around the court. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right, back to uh, Exodus chapter 38, and um, so if you recall, I took, uh, I took one sermon to preach chapters 25 to 30, so this massive, quick overview of what's going on. Let's not miss the forest of the trees when it comes to the tabernacle and what's happening there. Um, and then now we're, we're sort of slowing down because verses, chapters uh, 35 to 40 allow us to, to see it again. And I want to focus in on each of these areas. Remember, we are now, I know this doesn't seem like it, but we are in the part, most people skip over this, but this is the most important part of Exodus. It's most important, this gets the most real estate. It gets the most, you know, ink spilled over it because this is, this is God saying, I want to dwell with my people. I, I want to be with them, right? This is what God's plan has been from the beginning, messed up by Adam and Eve, but he works to remedy that. He's in the tabernacle. He comes, he's going to be a part of the temple. We come to the New Testament, we discover we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we go to uh, heaven and we're with God, it's a new temple, it's a new Jerusalem, it's a place where God dwells. This is the theme of Scripture, God dwelling with His people. Now, it's not easy for God to dwell with His people. There's a real problem, right? The problem is God is perfect and holy and righteous and sinless, which is why every time anybody gets within a, a, any distance of God, they feel the unworthiness. And God says, you can't be in my presence and live. There's a big problem. We're sinful, God's not. God has, because of his holiness and because of our sin, has become dangerous to us. So that the smallest of sin is enough to incinerate us before God. Now, th that's how we talk, right? That's, we, we think, well, my sins are all small. I don't murder people. You know, I'm not into espionage. I'm not defrauding people, whatever. I'm not, not stealing from banks. We, we tend to minimize our th sin and think it's a, it's, it's a small thing. So it'd be unfair for God to punish me for my sin or for me not to be able to have a relationship with him. But, but look, it's, 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 like, it's like if, I know it sounds silly, but imagine an astronaut, okay? <laughs> Bear with me. And, and, and he's, he's got pinholes in his spacesuit. Okay, look, he can whine all day long that these are small things that shouldn't make a difference, but they do. He will die, right? Those small little, little impurities, those small little, you know, pinholes are going to mean his death. So God, this isn't, it's not an issue of fairness or unfairness. It's just a fact. It just is. 
Same with God. It's not an issue of fairness. It's just a fact. So you can decide you don't want to deal with that or you can listen to what Scripture says. So, so God says, look, I want to be with my people. Here's this problem. And yet God makes a way. That's the tabernacle. That's what he's doing. And, and by the way, let me, let me situate us, okay? Chapters 25 to basically 31 are all about how God wants to build the tabernacle, okay? And then we get to chapter 32 and something horrific happens. In fact, it's so bad that it almost, it's almost the end. Um, it's, the, it's the worship of the golden calf, the erection of the worship of the golden calf. So we spent many weeks kind of walking through that section of scriptures. That's going to last us from 32 to, to, to 34, right? And this is, this is God saying, man, they, we almost lost it. God almost walked away from us. This was about the end of us as a people. And God's saying, I have every reason to wipe you out. And the people know this. We sinned so bad, God had every right to eliminate us and he doesn't. Because we turn the page after all of that and after God remedying it through a mediator and a sacrifice, we turn the page and we get to chapter 35 and that's when Moses stands up and says, we need to take an offering. God's gonna build the temple. God's gonna build the tabernacle. And he asks for an offering. Now, now I, want you to, I want you to see the order of events here, okay? Um, I wanna build the temple. You've sinned horribly. You've sinned in such a way but I have every right to walk away from you. I have every right to leave you and let you die in the wilderness, but I don't. Now, in God's magnanimous mercy and grace, he makes a way to come back and say, now I'm gonna be with my people. Then there's an offering. You, you follow what I'm doing here? What's happening here? It's always this way in scripture. It's always what God gives and we give in response to that. Giving to God, that kind of like I'm gonna respond to God through giving, Chris just talked about it, is, 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 is never a condition for receiving mercy. It's always a response to mercy. That's where I wanna start today. I want you to see, as I think this passage is, is asking a couple of questions that I want to see. And the first, I'll just give you the outline. The first question we're going to answer is, is what shall we offer to God? And the second one is, what does God offer to us? Okay, what shall we offer to God? And, and so we're going to sort of skip the order here, but we're going to start there. Okay, what shall we offer to God? Okay, now notice, if you go to, to verse 8, they, they, there's these women, we'll talk about this in a moment, who offer up their, their mirrors. This is very interesting. We'll get back to that. And then in verses 24 to 31, you've got all of this gold and silver and bronze. Other places, we're going to talk about the fabric they gave. Uh, all of the stuff that was needed. This is overwhelming generosity. They give out of their wealth. These are former slaves who had nothing. Okay, and again, these are picture after picture we're supposed to see. This is our condition. We've got nothing. God saves us. They didn't have any reason to believe that God should be that magnanimous in his mercy, but he is. And out of that, they give, and they give abundantly, like, like um, a, a ton, literally one ton of gold and three and a third tons of, of silver and two and a third tons of bronze. It's massive generosity. There's a story told in 2 Samuel 24 where King David wants to go and make an offering to God and he goes and he wants to buy this threshing floor. It's actually the place where the temple eventually would sit of Ar Ar Arona and he goes and he says to Arona, I want to buy the field and Arona falls on his feet. You know, get, maybe he's afraid of the king. We don't quite know, but he says, king, no, 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 you take it. I want to give you this place. And listen to how King David responds. He says, the king said to Arona, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the ox and the 50 shekel for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. I want to give you I, this. What shall we offer to God? David says, I'm going to give him something that costs me. I'm going to give him out of the preciousness of, of what he's given to me. And this is Israel, right? This is exactly what happens with Israel. They give of their precious possessions. They're people who had just a few months ago nothing. They were slaves. They own nothing. And, and here now they finally have something and they begin to give back to God a portion of what he's given them. They have an offering, right? This is, this is the, the, the very first sort of inklings of what we talk about here. Um, in fact, um, 
Why, why did they give? They gave because they understood. They saw what God had done. God, you could, have, you could have eliminated us. You could have left us to die on our own. You could have left us in the wilderness. You didn't. You kept coming after us. You kept pursuing us. You kept drawing us to yourself. And for that, God, because of your mercy and grace, man, we now want to give back to you. And they give their most precious possessions. In fact, look at this. Here, the impulse of that kind of grace is always generosity. Look at verse eight with me. He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Isn't that an odd sentence? He made them and he tells us out of what? Now, why is that important? Why does Moses include this kind of detail? I think he, like, look in, let's situate ourselves. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about slaves that at this point owned nothing. Now imagine you're a slave in Egypt, okay? Egypt at this point in history, you can see it in some, in some of the hieroglyphics. You'll see sort of the cosmetics on women. They're known for beauty and cosmetics. They're known for made, making cosmetic objects. And one of those that they're known for is making mirrors. So they would take, they would take a, a precious metal, a bronze, a silver, a gold, they would polish it, flatten it, polish it to a high sheen, and they had mirrors to be able to look at themselves and make themselves more beautiful. These are slaves. They never had a chance to do any of that. I think we can, we can assume. And what happens, we find out when the exodus happens right after all those plagues, God delivers them and it tells us on the way out, out of their own precious possessions, the Egyptians just gave them all this stuff. So you can imagine, you are a woman, you worked for all these, you worked for a really beautiful woman and you're like, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're wanting, you, you long for that kind of beauty but you can't have it because you're a slave and on the way out, she hands you a mirror and for the first time in your life, you can look at your face. For the first time in your life, ladies, you can go, now I can try to be beautiful. And some ladies are ministering at the tent of meeting. Remember this is where Moses, where Moses would go to pray? They're meeting there and, they're, and maybe, I don't know, Moses makes the call, we need bronze for the basin. And one of these women go, go, goes, I don't have much, but I have a mirror. Why did suddenly beauty not become important? Well, that's never happened in history among women, right? I don't think that's the issue. I think what happened is they said there's something more valuable. There's something more beautiful. There's something more wonderful. And I want to give to that. Isn't that amazing? Here's them saying, man, I, I see there's, a, there's something greater here. I want to give freely out of this. And this is going to go to make one of the furnishings inside the courtyard, inside this place that's consecrated for the Lord's service. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And by the way, um, th th this, is, this is the motivation for sacrificial service all the way through Scripture. Remember, it's never a condition, it's always a response. When Paul, when you get to the New Testament, and when Paul wants to encourage and motivate people to give, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't say, hey, listen, um, I've got these hankies, and if you send me your money, I'll anoint them and send them back to you, and your house will be prosperous. He's not a huckster. He says, I'm going to motivate you. The reason I want you to give is I want, I want this gospel to be true to you. So, so, so listen how he does this. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, I say this not as a command. By the way, this whole, chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are all about giving. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is genuine. I, I, I'm going to ask you to give. I want, you, I want to see your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's how Paul motivates people. I want you to see what Christ has done for you. I want this to seep down. I want your heart to marinate in this because when it does and you really understand this, then what's gonna happen? The impulse that gets driven out of that is an impulse of generosity. Man, that's why I wanna give. I don't give because somebody stands up on a stage and, and uses guilt and pressure. I give because God has been so generous to me and I see it. 
He, he talks about, he goes on in chapter nine to say, give, but that our giving should be cheerful. Now think about your own giving, whatever it is, to your children, to a vacation, to buy a car, whatever, or, or, or to church or whatever you do. Why do you give? Why do you spend your money that way? You want to, like you're eager for it. Paul says, I want that to characterize the giving of a Christian, that I want it to be cheerful. So in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, each one must give as he's decided in his heart, right? Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Don't hold back, but don't feel like somebody's pressuring and twisting your arm. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, He's going to talk about giving being a grace of God. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. Who are the poor? It's us. We were poor. We were poor in spirit. We, 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 were, we were without God, without hope. God's given freely to us. His righteousness endures forever. Right? Th- th- this, is, this is what motivates. See, if you know what Christ, God has done for you in Christ, like that, that works its way down into your heart Man, what comes out of that is generous, cheerful giving. It's the grace of God overflowing in your life. That, that, that's always the motivation. This is why women would give their mirrors. This is why people would give their possessions. This is why we would give out of the things that God has done for us. See, listen, Christian, let me talk to you for a moment. This means there should be no such thing as a stingy, greedy, hoarding Christian. That just shouldn't exist. That's an oxymoron, right? Why? Because we're people that say we are recipients of the greatest act of generosity the universe will ever see. We have an eternal home. We are secure. Like, I, 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 I am going to have every dream of I've ever had come true someday. And because of that, man, I, I, I never have to worry, like Chris said, that God is being good. I'm never going to have to doubt that. There should not be such a thing. We should be people who give, give generously, give cheerfully because God's changed our hearts, because God's rescued us, because of what God has done. Okay, so that's the first thing. What shall we offer to God? I think as all the people of God, we should be generous. But there's another thing that I think we find this, and that's what should the, what, so that's what the people of God, and I would put myself in that place as well, but what do the leaders of the people of God offer? And that's accountability. Do you notice this? Go, go to verse 24. And just look at this. Look at the inventory we get. Remember we said all these shekels and, and, and weights and balances, right? There's this massive amount. And here's what's Moses doing there. What's, why is he telling them all this? I think what he's doing is he's saying, look, I want to give you an account. I want you to see we actually stewarded what you gave us. I didn't build a big, nice bronze house or whatever. I didn't build myself and line the coffers of, of my own bank account. I, I did it, and we were good stewards, Israel, of what you gave to us. So right here, it's amazing, at the beginning of the people of God, we have this, we have this, uh, this pattern developing. Paul's going to pick up on this in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Here's how we handled your money. Here's what we did. We were careful. So I think it's good for you to know. Some of you are new. And you're like, so what does, a bucket's just went by. What happens with that? Like, where does this money go that we give to the church? I want to, I want to talk to you really briefly, okay, about how we handle your money. I think it's, I think it's important for you to know this, Okay just to sort of hear the safeguards and the things we put around it to make sure that we're being good stewards of resources you give to us, right? So several things. First thing, I think it's important you know, I never, never touch the offering. Literally, I've never been in the room when the offering is counted. I, if some of you hand me a check and say, can you put this in the offering? I'm gonna say no, but there's a black box. You can go put it, you can hand it to one of our ushers, but I don't want it, right? I, I, don't, I don't want ever. There, in order for us to spend money at Foothill Church, there has to be two signatures on a check and I'm not one of them. I don't know the combination to our safe, literally. Um, I, I don't know like account numbers, none of this stuff. Now that's good, that's right, I shouldn't, that should be separate, right? I, I don't want to know that stuff. And, and I, I tell you that because I, I think sometimes there's this idea that, wow, you're just sort of pulling the financial strings. That's just not happening. That's just not true, okay? 
That's the first thing. Second thing is, uh, there is a chain of custody with your money. In other words, there's, there's never a time when someone is alone with your offerings. There's always two, three, maybe more people in the room. And usually there's going to be someone who's not on staff, right? That's sort of paid to count your offerings and things like that. It's going to be somebody outside, some volunteer that comes to sort of hold us accountable that way. Number three, we do audited financials by a CPA, reputable CPA firm every single year. And if you want to see them, you can go online. We post them for you to see, okay? Like like this is how our finances uh, came out, right, for the year. And we put those up there for for, for you to see, all right? Like, Like so we've got independent CPA audited financials that others are looking over our shoulders and saying, okay, you've, you've done this right, or hey, tweak this, or do that, or do this better, and we do that. Uh, number four, the elders. The elders look over our shoulders, right? The, every single month, the, we, we have a board of elders. You saw this. They, they are able to see all of our finances. They get monthly reports. They're, you know, they can ask questions. They can dig as deep as they want to go to find out exactly what's going on there. And then lastly, we, are, we have voluntarily submitted ourselves to a, a group called the ECFA, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, where they are as an independent agency look at churches and religious organizations say okay have have we been careful to follow good habits of stewardship and then every year they approve you or they don't approve you we didn't have to do that but we do that so we can say to people like you look we're trying to put these safeguards around us we want to be accountable and 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 we want to be careful and give an account for the way that we're we're spending the resources that God entrusts to us okay that's what I think is happening with Moses here I think it happens in the New Testament I think that should be the pattern of the church and this is what we want to do with you so what do we offer to God we offer him as a people of God we offer him generosity what do the leaders offer we offer in return accountability okay That's the first question. The second question is, what does God offer to us? And this is really what I want you to see and what's what the the meat of this. That in fact, we probably could have flipped these over. It's what God offers to us that leads to what we offer to God, okay? And what God offers to us is this tabernacle. And the tabernacle isn't just a bunch of furnishings that sort of, oh, isn't that neat that they did that and there's a tent? No, every one of these things point to a greater reality, Every one of these things point that God is offering us something, God is doing something, and there's something bigger than just that piece of furniture, okay? So like what? What does God offer to us? First of all, once you see he offers us a way to him, okay? So it's actually, you're in chapter 38. Go over to uh, verse 18, uh, and just, uh, you'd have had to be reading very carefully, but just notice this. And the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linens and tribe the cubits, how big it was. Their pillars were four in number. Their four bases were of bronze, okay? This is the curtain. What are we describing here? He's describing the courtyard had this big curtain going around it and there was uh, uh, an entry curtain. Now, what I want you, you, you may not have noticed this, but, but the colors and the fabric of the entry curtain into the courtyard are the identical colors fabric of what takes you into the tabernacle, right? So you understand the tabernacle sits inside of the courtyard. Now, why? Why is there, why is there this, you might say, color-codedness to, to this, this whole complex, Right, this is, this is, they'd see this color and understand every time I see this color, I'm moving toward the presence of God. This is God, this is Moses, this is this, this pictorial way of saying, here's a way in. This is how you come into God's presence. There's no digging under, there's no climbing over, there's no running around. God has ordained a way of you walking into his presence. Now, some of you are ahead of me, right? Because you know nothing changes when we get to the New Testament because Jesus is gonna say, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's gonna say in, in, in Matthew chapter seven, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And then Jesus goes, and by the way, John chapter 10, I am the gate. It's me you come through. 
This is how we enter. This is, this is the way in. The first point of entry is I come to God through Jesus Christ. By the way, listen a lot of times how we pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask this in Jesus' name. We come to you, right, through the Son. Like that, that's that, that's going to be ways that we pray because this is how we access God. There is no direct, unmediated access to God. We come through this narrow way. We come through the gate. And according to the New Testament, that, that way is Jesus. So, so what does he offer? Hey, I'm, I'm opening a curtain. There's a way for you to come in. But the second thing is, he offers us a sacrifice for our sin. So what happened? When you walk through, if you go to chapter 38, you're, you, you, right there at the beginning, he made an altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Now, if you saw the temple, you'd see the, the tabernacle layout, you'd see the courtyard, and this curtain brings you in, and boom, when you walked in, you would be confronted by this massive altar. Think of it, and I don't mean any irreverence by this. It's a ginormous barbecue. It's huge. And there it stands before you, and it is constantly burning. And people day after day, hour after hour are bringing sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. There is this altar for sin in front of you. Animals, these animals are coming in and they're substitutes. They are totally, we could say, innocent animals. And so I as a worshiper, I come because I know, right? I, there's things that, that I'm, 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 I'm feeling that I, I, I know are out of sync with God and I. And so there's all these offerings in scripture. There's fellowship offerings. I wanna have fellowship with God, bring an offering. I've sinned, bring an offering. I'm guilty of this, bring an offering. Day of atonement, I'm recognizing my sins. The priest first goes in, offers up a sacrifice for himself and then offers one for the people. Blood, blood, blood blood everywhere, blood. I cannot even imagine. And it is a screaming testimony when you walk in that this is the price of sin. And I'm looking in a very pictorial, illustrative way at what sin costs. So I'd walk in with my lamb or two turtle doves or a bull or a goat or whatever and I'd be a worshiper and I'd come in with that goat or that lamb and I would put my hands on that lamb symbolically transferring my sin to, to this little innocent perfect lamb and then offer it up. What am I saying? Now take this, right? There's a statement being made there. Here's my sacrifice, Lord. Let it, let it be offered in my place. And, and Lord, may you accept its death as the wages for my sin. That's what's happening in Israel all the way back in Exodus. Let, let it be the payment for the wages of my sin. See, we don't just march into God's presence. Do you know this? We come through a sacrifice. You come to Jesus then you come to the altar, this altar for sin, this altar that sets before you the magnanimity, we might say, the ever presence of your sin. And we go, I've got to offer, like there's, there's, a, there's something, there's no getting around this. I can't, I, I can't escape this altar. The clear message being proclaimed to Israel that's gonna go all through scripture is sin brings death. That's the wage of sin and only a sacrifice can cover that sin. Only a sacrifice can make you right. Now, okay, here's a question. Um, did Old Testament sacrifices actually atone for sin? Don't answer out loud. I think the answer is yes and no. Okay, ready? Yes, because God said, bring these as an atoning sacrifice. Okay? That, 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 that is going to be the way. I'm willing to accept these sacrifices, but here's the key. In anticipation of the future. Here's how Paul's gonna say it. In Romans chapter three, 
He says in verse 24, right, that God put, or verse 25, God put Jesus forward as a propitiation. This is how we were, God became pro us by his blood to be received by faith. Now look at this. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So there's these, these sins. God says, okay, I'm, I'm going to pass over these waiting for this future sacrifice. And so this is exactly what happened. In fact, the Old Testament, so when I say yes, yes, I'm going to accept these temporarily as a holding spot, but no, they will not because the Bible says, the Old Testament says, the blood of bulls and goats don't take away sin. So you're an Israelite. Offer a sacrifice, but then somebody's teaching me, these don't actually take away sin. What am I doing here then? Oh, oh, so this is a symbol of what's to come. I'm offering these things because it's, it's pointing, it's a shadow of a reality that's in the future. By the way, this is why Paul is going to say things like, this was a mystery. In Old Testament Israel, they were like, they called it, like this is a, this is a mystery that's been hidden for ages, but now is revealed in what Christ has done. Aha, so this pointed, now we see it clearly, it's Jesus. They didn't know his name, they weren't quite clear, but here's, if you wonder how an Old Testament saint was saved, they weren't saved because they put their faith in a lamb, they were but they were saved because they've put their faith in a future sacrifice. So they looked forward and said, Lord, accept this as the wages of my sin for that day when you finally sacrifice for all the sins of the world. What do we do? We look backward and go, we see Jesus. And we see what the Bible says. And now what do we do? We come and we say just what an Old Testament Israelite would have said. Lord, here it is. Here's my sacrifice. Please, God, accept this in my place as my substitute. His death as the wages for my sin once for all, and may his blood give me access to you. See how this is all laid out? Come through this curtain. Here's what I'm offering you. I'm offering you a way in. Do you know? Are you an outsider looking in? How do, I get, how do I get to God? How do I become a Christian? I come through Jesus. I'm confronted with my sin. I see what it costs. I repent of that sin. And I put my faith in the sacrifice that's been made for me. That's conversion. That's what takes you from darkness to light. That's what takes you from outside to inside. That's the way in. But, but, but there's, there's something else going on here. There's another piece of furniture in that courtyard, and it's a basin. We, we read about it in verse 8, right? He made the basin of bronze. It's a wash basin. It's filled with water, in fact. Now, what's that about? This is, what's God offering us? A way to him. He's offering us a sacrifice for sin, and he's offering cleansing from what we might call remaining or indwelling sin. Okay, in fact, um, if you go back to chapter 30 and uh, verse 20, uh, yeah, verse 20, okay, this is just describing the bronze basin again, and chapter 30 says this, talking about the priests, when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. So what's happening? So every time the priest was going to make an offering, he would wash his hands, wash his feet, right? I'm, I'm, now, 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 why? Um, David Levy uh, says this. He says, the wash basin, the laver, some of your translations say, speaks of Christ as our sanctification, right? As believer priests, we are reminded that Christ has sanctified us for his service and is sanctifying us by cleansing us from the daily defilement of sin with washing of water by the word, Okay, so, so that, that this, is a, this is again a picture, right? None of this stuff washes away sin, but it's, it's pointing us to this reality that, yes, the debt of sin has been canceled by the sacrifice. The, if I were to use the capital S sin being, being the big, the, the sort of problem of sin over our lives is canceled. Never, you're never condemned by it again. God will never hold that against you. But every day, I still need forgiveness, don't I? I still need to repent. I still see we're not perfect, we sin all the time. I know I do. 
right? And so we, we need something that will allow us this cleansing. Remember what Jesus does? It's very interesting. He comes and he washes his disciples' feet, John 15. And he gets to Peter, and Peter being the impetuous one, is like, no, no, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, look, Peter, if I don't do this, you have no part of me. Oh, well, then wash me from head to toe. Peter, bro, you don't get it. You just need your feet washed. What's he saying? Like, look, there's still indwelling sin. The, the capital S sin has been taken care of. It's all these little sins. Peter, your arrogance and all these other things. Those are being daily washed. That's why Martin Luther, when he nails the 95 theses on the Wittenberg door, right? Number one says, when our Lord and Master commanded us to repent, he wanted the life, the whole life of a believer to be one of repentance. We are constantly faced with our sin. Is there cleansing from that? Well, it's never going to condemn us to death. But we're asking God, we're saying, Lord, sanctify. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to quit going back to the cesspool of sin. I want to stop in those things. And so this is this picture that there's this cleansing. So here we have, it's amazing, right? Here in this courtyard, we have the entry point, Jesus. We have the two great doctrines of the Christian faith. Justification through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus sanctification through the washing so, so that John is going to pick up on this in 1 John and says if we confess our sins he's talking to believers he's faithful he's just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness does it ever feel slow Christian all the time right so frustrating and yet there's the promise that God is at work in you and someday, this is why when, when Paul gives us that amazing golden chain in Romans 8, right? Those whom he, he predestined, right? He called, those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. And Paul uses this idea of glorified. He, he says it in the past tense like it's already done. Like there's coming a day, Christian. There's coming a day when all these sins that we wrestle with, all these thoughts, all these impulses, all these things, we're like, I'm so sick of this. Forever gone. You will be glorified. And you'll never struggle with them again. What's happening in the wash basin, right? It's this progressive needing to go back again and again. God, wash me. God, help me. I want to be done with these sins. I want to be more holy. I want to be more like your son. This is beautiful. That's what's happening. So, so what does God offer to us? He offers us a way in. He offers us a sacrifice for sin. He offers us cleansing from remaining sin. How do we respond to that? Generosity. That's Exodus 38. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your overwhelming, magnanimous generosity to us. We thank you for the death of your son. We thank you. Jesus, where would we be if there was no remedy for our sin? If there's no ability to change? Where we were stuck? But because of Jesus, Lord, you have rescued us. We will not pay the eternal consequence for our sin. And because of Jesus, we can be cleansed in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can, we can be cleansed incrementally, day after day, progressively toward holiness. Father, I pray, encourage our hearts through that. But I also pray, Lord, I, I, I pray that that perhaps there'd be somebody in this room or hearing me right now outside that, that would say, I, I see it. I, I see the gospel on display. I, I see my need. I, I've never known how to rid myself of the guilt of sin. And here they have the answer that it's through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Here's my sacrifice, God. We can't sacrifice for ourselves. Jesus has done it for us. 
And I pray today would be a day where people would, would come in, see their sin, repent. As you draw near to them, they would see the overwhelming magnitude of their sin, but they'd also see the overwhelming mercy and grace of, your, of the sacrifice of your son. And put their faith in that and be saved. And then all of us together would go back to the wash basin, go back again and again and be cleansed and become more holy in the washing of the water through the word. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.